The Slow County Real Estate Podcast had the perfect storm for their first live podcast. Silicon Valley Bank had just collapsed, PG&E's benefits to solar customers and owners are soon changing, and interest rates in the mortgage markets are actually improving to instill buyer's confidence. In this episode, Ben Lerner from Cross Country Mortgage makes an appearance to give some tips when it comes to your lending. Any bank worth their weight in gold right now would do a free refinance for a client that buys right now down the line. It's, it's a win-win situation. Get in now because we're not going to see a glut of inventory coming on. So it's going to be more buyers as rates come down competing for that same low inventory and that's price pressure, that's supply demand. Team Swayze navigates the stormy waters with cooler heads with the focus on long-term real estate investing to build wealth no matter what the real estate microclimate is when it comes to your neighborhood. Live from Milestone Tavern on March 13th, here's your market report for March 2023 with your host and MC for the evening, James Bueno. Welcome everybody to our latest live episode for the Slow County Real Estate Podcast with House Lazy. Yes. Along with the entire crowd this year, Mr. Swayze. Let's give House Swayze a hand for us. Another one. How accept your kudos. Let everybody know you're here, Hal. Thank you very much. That's all my relatives. <laughs> Mr. J. Pete is with us. Give him a hand, everybody. And the legend himself in a Hawaiian shirt, Mr. John Turner. There you go, JT. So, Hal, today we, it's market update time. We haven't done yeah. one for uh, 30 days, obviously. So uh, let's just get rolling. Unless you want to make fun of Jay or John first. No. No? No. Or we being, we being nice but, but this is fun to be in a room full of people. It is. Because it's usually quiet when we do it. So it's nice to have all these great, shine, yeah. smiling faces here. And um, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it awkward that we're just facing a bunch of people and they're just staring at us right now? No. Because no. most of them had not had enough to drink yet. So that'll, <laughs> that'll change. So all right. Good. Yeah. Drink up, yeah. everybody. All right. How, yeah, let's so do the, it. So what we do is like to recap the market uh, once a month. So this is basically for most of uh, all of February and a little bit of March. We sometimes put a label on what's happening. So it's different. What's that song? Changes in attitude, changes in latitude. Who sings that? Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett. Ah, yeah. He wears so, a Hawaiian shirt. So we've had the same market conditions, kind of the same news since about last March, when more homes for sale, less homes selling. What's happening in prices? So this month has finally changed a little bit. But but I always like to put it in context. So we look at like the number of houses for sale. So that went up 63 percent over last year. That sounds like a lot, but it's 144 houses to 235 houses, right? So that's not very many for a town of, or a county of 250,000. So, so a change in the inventory, but a change in the trajectory. So we've seen, usually we have more homes for sale as we head into March. That has been a change. So less homes for sale this month than last month. Pending sales down last year, record year, only 9% offer a huge year last year. I mean, last February of 2020, Two was a crazy market. And we're only down 9% for pending, so that's pretty impressive. Month over month, though, February over January, 33% more in one month than last month. So it kind of tells you like a little shift in the marketplace. Solds are down about 20%, so we, that's to be expected, but up last over last month, 27%. And then finally, new homes on the market, you know, we had about 5% more this month than a year ago. So here's what we take from this. We had like 148 places go into escrow last month. We only had 78 new places come on the market. So what does that mean? More are selling. So what, you know, John, you're good with math. What is that going to mean for the months going ahead for inventory? Well, it's, it's hard to imagine that prices are going to crash if inventory is as low as, as it is. You, had, you said 235 houses on the market right now, right? Correct. Okay. To give perspective to everyone here, two months after COVID hit, there were 880 houses for sale in the market. So for all of us that took at least Econ 101, we're talking about supply and demand, right? Right. And so when there isn't much supply and demand still at least equal to or maybe still exceeding supply, it's hard to imagine prices coming down much. I know they're a little softer than they were a year ago. Sure. But it's, it's hard to imagine that there's the market crash that everybody wants to Well, and then what's going to happen? So if 148 are going away and only 78 are coming back, that means we're not going to have a lot more homes for sale in the coming months. So, so if I were to look forward, I would say if we look at our trajectory where we're going, 
Um, I'm going to say in a couple of months, all the numbers are going to be better this year than they were last year because the market changed a lot. So, you know, we look at trajectory versus position, and that, that's a big deal. We simply still don't have that many homes for the buyer demand we have. And I think it's interesting because we've got um, Christy from Fidelity Title here was talking about cash <laughs> offers. Christy, yeah. <laughs> right? Hey, yeah, round of applause. And, and so people go, well, rates are so high. Well, last year, um, about the first three months of the year, um, we had like 50% cash sales. That's a lot. This year we've had 65%, so it's gone up. The profile of the people that come to town or are buying is a lot stronger financially than it used to be. So it's, it's just, it's a different situation. And those people like San Luis Obispo and they don't have many choices. So that's really supported our prices. The mortgage rates have had a big hit on the market, right guys? I mean, we, we all know that. They've gone up the fastest ever. They, that was like uh, one of our lenders here, Ben Lerner, was saying, you know, hey, what they used to do in a year or two, they did in like three or four months. They just raised rates so rapidly. So there was an adjustment period. But I would say also our finance buyers are coming back and going, all right, I, I got to deal with 6% or 5.5% or whatever it is. And then we even have lenders that are now offering, like at Ben's office, right, they'll pay a first year 1% uh, reduction in their rate. So there's lots of things that we're doing out there that are keeping the real estate market moving along. Uh, Jay, you see it from a more global perspective, from a company-wide. Yeah, I do. What, what have you noticed? Uh, you know, to, um, to your point about the cash buyers and the increase, we're, we're, you know, I think there's a, there's a, a, a trifecta there. You know, the, the triad of, of what's happening, like Prop 19, allowing someone that, let's say, lives in the Bay Area or in, San Francisco, or in L.A., they've got you know, huge equity in their house. They paid 300000 for it. They're selling it for $3 million, right? They don't want to move anywhere because they're paying property taxes on a $300,000 house. Well, with Prop 19, if they're over 55, they can take their tax basis and bring it to San Luis. So we're seeing a huge influx of cash. And that's where I believe a lot of those cash buyers are coming from. Plus, we're also seeing like this huge transfer of economic wealth, the largest the country's ever seen, from the you know the greatest generation and the boomers to their kids, and their kids then are now the ones that are moving here. And then on top of all that, COVID did something really unique for us, where if you're you know living in Silicon Valley or you're working in Silicon Valley but you can't afford to buy a house in San Jose, you're living in Fresno and commuting. Well. Now now you can work from home. So if I'm working from home and I just inherited a bunch of money from my parents, I'm not going to work from home in Fresno. I'm moving to the coast. So we're seeing a lot of that come into our, and I think that's where those cash buyers are coming from. And I don't see that slowing down. Uh, it's not going to slow down for a decade. Is that why you moved here from the Valley? Big inheritance? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Global? Yeah, yeah okay, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some hot topics. Okay. Okay, we did a podcast a couple weeks ago on solar. And, and since we did that podcast, um, Don and I have signed up for solar on our house, and three or four of our friends have done the same thing. And there's, it's, there's some urgency behind uh, the message about solar. You want to give us a little bit of an update on that? Yeah, we were shocked because we had a great response, and we had a, a solar specialist come in. Um, what, what was Nick's company called? Do you remember? Something? Slowcraft. Slowcraft. Slowcraft, yeah. yeah. All I know is this. So if I have a solar system, which I do in my house, I... You know, during the day, I don't really need it, and it feeds PG&E, and I give them one kilowatt hour, and uh, they pay me one back at night when I need it, right? So what they're doing is changing on April 15th. If you put one into the system, one kilowatt hour, they're going to give you 0.25 back. So the value of your solar just went down. So you either have to have, what, a way bigger system, more panels or something to get the equivalent storage. amount. Or you're going to have to buy a, a battery for yeah. yeah. 15000 bucks. Yeah. 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 And, Which is uh, what they're trying to incent, it sounds but, like. But anybody who has their permit, and that, that's just it, have your permit approved by PG&E by April 15th will be grandfathered for 20 years into the one-for-one one exchange. So you don't have to actually build the system. So if you know of anybody, if you guys are listening, solar, get with a solar provider. You can call us. We'll give you some names. But they're the ones who will get your application in. And you're locked in. You're freezing your electrical costs. But the clock's ticking. The clock is... Uh, it, it, it's, we put in our application about 10 or 12 days ago, just got it today. Yeah. Oh, so, good. So you got April 15th, so you got to work backwards. If you don't have your application in by April 1st, you're too late. That is a very time-sensitive thing, and if you even are having an inkling of getting solar, it's worth it. Did it cost you any money to get that application in? A thousand dollar deposit. Okay, a deposit, deposit to go towards the... It goes system. towards the, the purchase of the equipment. Okay, so you just... Yeah, so and, they know they're going to do your and, for you. For those of you who don't know, you get a 30% tax credit, not a, not a tax deduction, a tax credit. 
dollar for so dollar. That, that's, yeah. that's a big deal. Hasn't so, been somebody been talking to you for years about doing solar in your family? And she's then suddenly, here. She's uh -oh. here. But, yeah. uh, she left, I, by the way. I, I, I didn't listen yeah. to her. <laughs> no, she's here. Yeah. And you have up to three years after that permit is accepted. So yeah. you can. I mean, it's the cheapest insurance policy for, um, for um, electrical stability you can possibly imagine. Yep. yep. Yeah. PG&E has a rate increase. In You're the, not affected, yeah. In, oh, right that's right. Yeah. yeah. Another reason. Somebody said to it was it. 36. I heard it was 18. It's a big one. Can we get back to the, the market update and talk about some specific numbers? Uh, sure. At, at each city, sales, listings. Oh, uh, yeah. Everybody likes to, to know those. Right. Our I, listeners do. Okay, good. So it's a good thing I brought these brand new glasses. So, Ooh. like in February, if we look at what happened, well, you know what? Uh, let's do what Jay did. Let's kind of put this in perspective because you had those headlines. Oh, yeah. Right? So, so this is always fun because people always ask us, is the market crashing? What's going to happen next? So th this information that I've got here, it's, it's from uh, Barry Habib. So I, Ben's in the room. I'm sure he knows who, who Barry is. Um, and the guy is like, uh, he is Zillow's crystal ball award winner year after year after year. This guy is spot on the money. But he brought something to light in a conference I was at that he presented, and it was really interesting. Um, these are like headlines from a, a national uh, broadcast, like CNBC. I won't, we don't need to know who it is, but it was, you know, these were the headlines. How is today a bubble larger than 2006? This was in 2015. In, in 2016, we're in a new housing bubble. In 2017, home ownership doesn't build wealth, study fines. 2018, it's better to rent than to buy in today's housing market. 2019, the housing market is about to shift in a bad way for buyers. Then 2019, next year will be hard on the housing market, especially in the big cities. And 2021, housing boom is over as new home sales fall to pandemic low. So if you'd listen to anything that the major media was selling you, you would, in San Luis County, have lost over $300,000 in equity. If you're allowing them to be your, econ your economist of choice when it comes to real estate, you would have lost over $300,000. And so the point of this statement is find an economist of choice. Hal and his team do an incredible job of making sure that they are in the know every moment of every day when it comes to the economics of real estate. Sensationalism sells does not the same type of sales that Hal and his team do. They do sales that are very, very specific to the microclimates and the markets that we're in. And that's imperative. I don't care who you are. You need to talk and work with a local person. Quit paying attention to the, to the mainstream media. When people ask us questions about, hey, what's going on in the market? This is a question we get every day, right? Sure. All the time. And, and you, you have to identify which market are we talking about. Are we talking about transactions? Are we talking about pricing? Two different markets. So... Big headlines in the paper, markets crashing. Well, in a sense, they were right. Right. Uh, the, we, we have uh, number about, of sales. about half of the number of sales we were having two years ago. But prices are up in most places in the county. And then which market? Is that San Luis Obispo City, Paso, Shell Beach? We yeah, talk about it, how, is it Laguna how Lake? specific. Is it yeah. Anholm? Right. Yeah. So very much so. Yeah, I mean, certain towns we look at, so like, okay, this year in uh, Morro Bay, there's 23 places for sale. Average price is a million dollars, right? We only had four close at $1.1 million. When did we go back to the last time? We were like talking about 2012 or something like that. Yeah, where, where it took, you know, and the average time on the market was 31 days. Mark Adams has been appraising for, how long have you been appraising, Mark? 26. Tw 26? 26. Jeez. Yeah, so can you imagine that you used to think back in the day that the average price for sales in Morro Bay is $1.1 million? The market, I would call it pretty normal. I mean, we'll look at Arroyo Grande, 22 homes for sale. Last year, uh, we had 21 sell. This year, 17 are in escrow. And the average price is $1.1 million, 44 days on the market. So the, the prices have done very well in this area. And I think for context, for me, I was talking to an, a gentleman I've known for a while. He's probably in the late 70s, early 80s, done very well. And he goes, I'm going to buy an investment property. Okay, were you looking for like a certain cash flow return or you like equity? And he goes, no, you know, equity appreciation. I go, really? He goes, yeah. I go, okay, well, cash prices have gone pretty high. He goes, hell, have you ever compared San Luis Obispo prices to Santa Barbara or Malibu? And he's like, well, yeah, I get it. And he goes, yeah, I mean, this place is better and now people aren't tied to jobs there. So we have all the three things you were talking about, transfer of wealth, transfer tax mm -hmm. base, job mobility. And then, you know, then you've got this wonderful place, so that this puts us right on par. So we're probably still 
underpriced. As scary as that seems if you're going to be a buyer, but it just tells you that this limited supply of homes, everything we have here, great university, amazing weather, ocean, hiking. I mean, there's just so much to attract here. It's just really good for being in real estate here. So it's, it's been phenomenal. That old adage of, uh, you know, what are the three most important things in real estate? Location, location, location. Like, we've got it in spades. We're here. And inheritance. Yeah, inheritance. Yeah, yeah very yeah. important. Very important. <laughs> you, you know, um, if you are, you mentioned buyers, Hal, and I think if we're looking at, you know, the buyers that are out there, you know, should I buy? Should I wait? The rates are coming down. Um, we get a lot of those questions. And, and what, I, the, what I'll, I'll suggest that people do, if you can afford to get into a place today, absolutely pull the trigger. If you look at the 30-year fixed mortgage over the past 40 years, 30 years at least, right? The 30-year fixed mortgage parallels, it mirrors, it's tied to the 10-year treasury. Now, it's usually floating between like a 1.75 to two points higher than the 10-year treasury, the 30-year mortgage rate. Um, Right now, we're at 3%. Why is that spread so much larger now than it was just a couple of years ago? And that's because the mortgage industry knows that rates are coming down and the cost for that money needs to be recouped because they're not going to have a loan that's being serviced for five, seven, ten years. It's only going to be a short period of time. So um, they know, the industry knows the rates are coming down. What happens when rates come down? More people are capable of buying homes, right? Yep. So your competition goes deal. through the roof. Just last year, we were seeing you know, 10, 12, 15 offers on properties and all over asking price. And today, that's much, much different. So if you've got the ability to get into a house now, absolutely execute because you're going to be dealing with less competition. And then when the rates come down, you can refinance. If you wait for the rates to come down, by the time you get your foot in that water, it's going to be swimming with piranha. Everybody trying to get into a property because they want to capture on that, capture that low rate. Ben, do you want to come up? And, <laughs> and so what do you make of what he just... Ben Lerner. Yeah. Ben Lerner. Ben Lerner. Cross-country mortgage. So, so, so Ben, what do you make of this differential, like all these years where there's like a 2% difference, now it's 3 right? Why is that? Is that price gouging by the lenders? <laughs> That's my headline. Sorry. <laughs> Why no, is that, Ben? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I, I think uh, Jay said, did a good job of explaining that. Um, no, actually, lenders and banks are working on a, a much tighter margin than in my 20 years I've ever seen. Right. So the margins are really thin. They're trying to help keep the rates down to help. And like you said, Jay, they're, the long-term rates know, the bond market, the long bonds know that we're heading to lower rates in the near term. And that's why we have, that's what just happened this last week with banks getting in trouble is that deposits need to pay a lot and right. the short-term rates are high and long-term rates are low. Right. And that's causing this, uh, this problem in the banks. So, so like the Silicon Valley bank deal, so they were only bringing in a low, you know, most of their assets brought in a low interest rate or low return and now they have to offer out a higher return. Is that, is that kind of what happened or how would you explain it to somebody that yeah, between smarter uh, than me? Between savvy depositors removing their deposits and putting them in high-yield savings accounts instead of leaving them in a bank where they need to be you know, paying out 0.1 or a half a percent in interest, right. those people pull them out and put them in higher-yield accounts, and so the banks have less deposits to offset their long-term commitments on mortgage notes, for okay. example. Okay. So they're, they're pulling money out of the banks. Yeah, the somewhat. banks make money off of the deposits. Sure. And if the deposits go away, they need to offset their long-term debts. So if they lose those deposits, obviously all of a sudden they're in a, in a bad position. They're, they're leveraged too much to pay those depositors who want to leave. So they need inventory. They need deposits. Yeah. But I also, I will say as I, as I leave the mic, I will say I agree 100%. It's a great time to buy for the purpose, exactly what you're saying. Any bank... Uh, that's worth their weight in gold right now would do a free refinance for a client that buys right now down the line. It's, it's a win-win situation. Get in now because I agree the pricing, we're not going to see a glut of inventory coming on. So it's going to be more buyers as rates come down competing for that same low inventory and that's price pressure. That's supply demand like you said. You're, you're working with a first-time home buyer. There's some fear out there in the marketplace. Yeah. So how, how do you, how do you counsel a first-time home buyer to let them know it's going to be okay? Yeah, I mean, my job, of course, is to counsel and make sure that they qualify. I'm, I'm against uh, first-time home buyers being on top ramen and oatmeal for the first year, but, you know, if they're a first-time home buyer, they've done their research, we get them fully pre-approved, even fully underwritten, so that we know they can qualify in a conservative way. And then we counsel that this is, when you buy a home, you're investing, 
And so long as you're not thinking you're flipping in a year or, or less and you're buying a home and it's going to be your home for five years or more, it doesn't have to be your forever home, then it's a great time to buy. Ben, I, I personally want to say thank you for helping uh, uh, our son buy their first home up in uh, Seattle. I, w- I would also say we were very disappointed when we closed escrow at 6%. At 6%. Yeah. And, and yet when rates went to 7 we got a little happier. Got a little bit better. And, <laughs> and, and then when they drop again here in the near term, we'll come see you again. That's so right. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure, John. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Ben. John. All right, gentlemen, I think that wraps up our market updates. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or statements? I would just say, you know, people get concerned really fast. And, and I, I remember when COVID started and there was a lockdown. I mean, you know, a lot of people were panicky. I'll be one of them, right? What's going to happen to everything? And, and then things have a way to work themselves out. Um, and then when we had this big change in the market, it just happened so fast. I mean, I, I think things happen so fast, it takes people a while to adjust, right? And I always kind of compare like house prices or interest rates to like putting gas in your car. It's like when it goes from three eight dollars to five dollars, you're pissed off. You change your habits, and then all of a sudden you just go, "All right, what's well, five dollars?" You know, I mean that's that's what happens with inflation. And if you look back years and years, I mean if you look at the rate of inflation, go back ten years, it looks way worse than if you just look like one year, right? So it just seems things go up in terms of price over time. John would argue wages for sure go up, so what we make and what people earn. But it's just one of those things to look at to try to stay calm in spite of all the things you hear about that Jay brought up. So, you know, just stay calm, make long-term you know, decisions, and you have good advisors in, in this group uh, to help you make a good decision. Jay, you have anything for us? Uh, I would say if you're looking at buying or selling, you know, there's, there's speculators. Let's talk about the, you know, not that the stock market is part of our conversation here, but it's easier to talk about someone that buys uh, an investment for the long haul and the speculator. Spec- day traders get burned. If you're flipping houses, you, yeah, you might get burned. But if you're investing in real estate for the long haul, you can't lose. There's only two, I think the two best times, this is a G- John quote here, the two best times to be real estate, to buy real estate 20 years ago and today. It's like, it's like that quote I have. It's, it's not timing the market. It's time in the market. In the market. That's yeah. a good one. You Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Say it all the time. Well done. You, you know, yeah. we watched, both of us watched a, a Warren Buffett video a few weeks ago, and he's been through, what, two world wars, a, a, a pandemic, multiple recessions, and the one thing he comes back to every time something seems to be going a little bit south is that he believes in America and he believes in the economy of America. I ask people that from time to time. Well, do you believe in, in, in the economy of America? And, you know, sometimes I get, I get some people that aren't quite sure. Right. And then I say, well, then tell me another economy of another country in the world that you believe in more than ours. And they can't answer that question. So I fall back on, I believe, believe in the economy of this country, and uh, we're going to have ups and downs. But in the long run, if you trust it, you're going to be good. And then when you're here in real estate, it's, is do you trust the economy of San Luis Obispo more than the economy of um, Delano, Modesto? No. Anyway, San Luis Obispo is a good place to be in. Why would you look at me and say Delano? Huh? I get confused where you're from originally, <laughs> in the valley. Let's, let's not James, that. you've migrated. You're good. I mean, you're in a good spot. Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you, you so much. Let's give these guys a round of applause thank for you. our first live podcast recording. Uh, that wraps it up. Uh, thank you so much. Don't miss next week's podcast for part two from Milestone Tavern for a question and answer session from those in attendance. Subscribe to the Slow County Real Estate Podcast with Hal Swayze to get it in your feed on the 27th to hear Team Swayze's answer to this question. Should I buy or should I rent right now in this market? And many others the moment it releases. Thank you for listening to the Hal Swayze Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and rate this podcast. It comes out every Monday, so check for it in your feed for the latest information on the San Luis Obispo County market. The Slow County Real Estate with House Swayze podcast is available wherever you get your podcast and on HouseSwayze.com where you can find current listings and other real estate tips. HouseSwayze.com, that's H-A-L-S-W-E-A-S-E-Y. Com. I am James Bueno, Director of Marketing for the House Swayze Group. If you're looking for anything real estate, give us a call, 805-781-3750. House Swayze is a licensed California real estate broker. DRE number 01111911. The Slow County Real Estate with House Swayze Podcast is a production of AGM Podcasts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.